you hit. Oh. Next Well, good evening. Can you can you hear me? Are we good? All right. Uh, so tonight we will be uh, studying the doctrine of the Trinity, and and it's been a while since we've been here. Uh, we are going through the series that we are calling "Why We Are Baptist." And what did we start off with, Rudolph? Where have we been so far? God is Creator. Right. What else did we do? Two, one ism, two ism. Right, right. Christ as Jesus as the Messiah. The Word. That's right. Scripture. So we're basically we're in a sense kind of going through the we're building a foundation of um, right belief that we are building on. That as we continue down this path, we'll get more and more specific to us as Baptists. But we're starting on the things really that we agree on with all Christians. And so tonight we'll be looking at the Trinity. And I wanted to start with this quote by Augustine. And this is one of the ways that he starts. He wrote a a book on the Trinity, and this is how he starts. And, And it's a wonderful expression of how I feel. So listen to what he says, and then we'll pray. Augustine says, and he's writing in the fifth century. He says, I will be attempting to say things that cannot altogether be said as they are thought by a man, or at least as they are thought by me. In any case, when we think about God the Trinity, we are aware that our thoughts are quite inadequate to their object and incapable of grasping him as he is. Now, since we ought to think about the Lord our God always and can never think about him as he deserves, since at all times we should be praising him and blessing him, and yet no words of ours are capable of expressing him, I begin by asking him to help me understand and explain what I have in mind and to pardon any blunders I may make, for I am as keenly aware of my weaknesses as of my willingness. What a wonderful expression of humility and kind of, of a uh, epistemological fear and trembling approaching the doctrine of the Trinity. So uh, let's, let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, as we begin tonight to explore uh, this doctrine, uh, Lord, we, we do so not out of a desire Uh, to just be stimulated intellectually, Lord, but out of a desire to know you better, out of a desire to know you as you have revealed yourself in Holy Scripture. So, Father, I do pray that you would help us to grasp the truths about who you are, about your triune nature that you have revealed to us in Scripture, Lord. Aid us tonight, edify our hearts as we seek to glorify you in learning tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, now, tonight, we're really going to be skimming the surface. Um, I mean, think about what we're talking about here. We're talking about the, the understanding, the knowledge of a holy, infinite, eternal, triune God who could be studied and meditated on for a lifetime, for an eternity, without ever reaching the end of his glory. And so tonight... For an hour, we're just going to be skipping a stone across the surface of the lake, so to speak. Um, so for some of you, it may still feel like a lot. For some of you, it may be unsatisfying, and that's just fine. But the Trinity uh, is a non-negotiable Christian truth. So if who's ever heard the term theological triage? Okay, one, two, okay, a couple. And it's, it's a pretty basic idea. It's the idea that within theology, and when we say theology, what we're talking about is the things we think about God. Okay, so it, it, it sounds fancy. It just means we, we all do theology. We either do it well, according to Scripture, or poorly, not according to Scripture. We all have thoughts about God. And so when we talk about theology, theological tri- triage, what it means is categorizing uh, what are the non-negotiable issues that we have to believe to be Christians, and what are issues that we can disagree on and yet still be Christians. So first here, 
the highest tier of the triage would be non-negotiable issues. So these would be doctrines, teachings uh, that you have to believe to be a Christian, at least a, a Orthodox Christian. So things like the deity of Christ. Okay, if you are a Christian, you have to believe that Jesus is God. What other things would you put in that first tier category? If you don't believe this, you're not a Christian. The gospel, right. Now maybe, yeah, there might be some, some things that you would distinguish in there, but if you don't believe in the gospel of Christ, not a Christian, absolutely. What else? Come on. The resurrection of Christ. Amen. Yes, there are people out there who claim to be Christians and don't believe in the resurrection. That's not Christianity. That's liberalism, as we talked about uh, one week. What else? Okay, so the, the true deity of Christ and the true humanity of Christ. Absolutely. We just talked about that on, in Sunday school on Sunday morning. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the existence of God is pretty basic. But within those, and there, there are others, uh, one of the things that would be in there is the Trinity, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. And we'll define that as we go on. Um, so this is not a uh, thing that's, oh, that's nice. Some people, you know, who are really smart might believe that, and, and we're not really sure. Um, no, if you don't believe the Trinity as taught by Scripture, you can't be a Christian. Now, what I'm not saying is if you're confused or you're ignorant, and I mean that in a literal sense, that you're not a Christian. Absolutely not. What we're talking about is people who explicitly deny that God is triune. Um, groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, groups like Mormons, and, and other things like that. First tier. So second tier would be things that um, Christians might differ on that would be such big issues that would probably not allow us to be in the same church. Okay? So things like baptism. Uh, do we baptize infants or not? That's an issue that we would say, yeah, you can be a Christian and believe that you can baptize babies, but it, it's going to be really hard for us to fellowship in the same church, right? Because baptism has to do with how one enters the church. Um, things like church government. So Presbyterians have sessions and presbyteries. We have congregational church government. Those are different things that if we have differences of opinion on that, it's going to be really hard to be in the same church. Does that make sense? But we would never say, oh, you believe in having a session? You're not a Christian. That would be really uncharitable. People have done that in the past. Um, Let's not repeat the error. Third tier would be the lowest tier. It doesn't mean that these things are less important, but it means that as far as our fellowship is concerned, we can have disagreements even within our church. So themes, things like the end times. Uh, you know, we may have disagreements and discussions about different views on that. We can worship side by side happily. Um, what other things would you put in that third tier issue? Rapture, yeah, stop, yeah, rapture, things like that, um, absolutely. So that's theological triage, and all that to say, the Trinity is a first-tier issue, absolutely non-negotiable. It is of the essence of what it means to be a Christian, because again, it deals with the very nature of who God is and what the gospel is. The gospel, in its most simple form, really is a revelation of the Trinity, so to deny the Trinity is to deny the gospel itself. And then, so that's kind of the, the theological or biblical perspective. But also, if you just take the historical perspective, which we've been doing, again, on Sunday mornings, the church, Christians have been fighting against Trinitarian heresies, people who deny the Trinity, uh, for 2,000 years. So since the very beginning, uh, the first group of Christians after the apostles have been fighting false teachers who have come in and tried to uh, confuse and water down and deny the doctrine of the Trinity. And this is one thing that the Trinity where uh, Ro the Roman Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, Protestant churches, all of us confess and believe the Trinity. Now we might have, again, some like little uh, disagreements on exactly how to express certain truths about the Trinity, but all of us hold that in common. All of us confess um, various creeds that explain this. So this is something that is of the absolute essence uh, of being a Christian. And the reason for that is, is because it is something that is taught clearly and plainly in Scripture. There's some myths out there that, it, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity was invented by the early church, or Constantine invented it at the Council of Nicaea. 
Uh, none of that is true. The doctrine of the Trinity is something that really was revealed in history as Christ became incarnate and came to us, and then that has come to us, passed down in, in Scripture. So if we want to think about God rightly, which I don't know why you would be a Christian and say, I don't care about thinking about God rightly, we must understand the Trinity, the triune nature of God. It determines how we live. It determines how we think about God. And so it determines how we worship God and, and who we think about God, how we think about God. So where does this word come from, right? The word Trinity is not in the Bible. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, and so it can sound in one sense a little um, strange to say this thing, the Trinity, you have to believe it to be a Christian, and someone could easily come back and say, and this is what a Jehovah's Witness would say, that word's not even in the Bible. So how can you say that that's definitional to being a Christian, right? It's a good question. Um, but just because the word that we use to describe the concept is not in the Bible doesn't mean that the truths that we are referring to by using the word Trinity is uh, not a biblical concept. So the same with when Mike said, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. Well, we have a theological term for that. It's called the hypostatic union, the union of the natures of Christ. You're not going to find that word in the Bible, but we're just using a word to summarize what the Bible teaches. Does that make sense? So the word Trinity uh, was coined by one of the church fathers. His name was Tertullian. He was writing in the uh, third century, and he was combating uh, a guy named Praxis who was distorting the truths from the Bible. And this is, this is what he said, and this is the first time we see the word Trinity appear in writing, at least writings that we still have today. Tertullian says this. He says, the simple, um, indeed, and he says, I'm not calling them unwise or unlearned, who always constitute the majority of believers are startled at the dispensation of the three in one. So he's, he's basically saying people who are unlearned in the Christian faith but are believers are kind of startled at the idea of the three in threeness of God and the oneness of God combined. He says, on the ground that their very rule of faith withdraws them from the world's plurality of gods to the one and only true God. In other words, they came out of paganism, away from polytheism. So now when you say, no, well, there's really... God is one, but he's also three. It can confuse a former pagan. He says they don't understand that. Although he is the one only God, he must yet be believed in with his own uh, economy. The numerical order and distribution of the Trinity, there's the, there's the first time he uses that word, they assume to be a division of the unity. So they assume that because God is three, he's not one. And he says, whereas the unity which derives the Trinity, don't worry, we'll talk about the stuff later, whereas the unity which derives the Trinity out of its own self is so far from being destroyed that it is actually supported by it. So he says if you understand the unity of God and the Trinity of God, these things actually support each other. They are constantly throwing out against us that we are preachers of two gods and three gods, while they take to themselves preeminently the credit of being worshipers of the one God. Just as if the unity itself with irrational deductions did not produce heresy, and the Trinity rationally considered constitute the truth. So there, don't worry if you didn't understand all that. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful. But that is the first time we see the word Trinity. And what happens throughout the history of the church is then people use that word because it's really a combination of tri-unity. So you get the three in one um, to start summarizing as a key term what the Bible teaches about the threeness and the oneness of God. That's where the word comes from. So, if anyone ever tells you, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, that shouldn't startle you at all. Um, that's not a secret. That's okay. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, at least primarily right now, is look at what the Bible teaches. Why do we believe that God is three in one? And what do we mean when we say that God is three in one? So it's, it, it, the first part of this is basically a biblical case for the Trinity. So the first thing we want to do when we, when we talk about this is start with the oneness of God. So there is, there is one God. God is one. Uh, Christians are monotheists. So when we talk about the oneness of God, the first thing that we want to understand, and, and this, will, this, will, uh, this will play throughout all of tonight, is uh, one thing we need to remember is what's called the Tetragrammaton. So if you look in your Bible, 
uh, if you turn to Deuteronomy 4.35, it's all over the place, but we're going to look at this text anyway. So if you turn to Deuteronomy 4.35, and you look at the verse, what you'll see is, so here's what Deuteronomy 4.35 says, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God, there is no other besides him. Okay, so there is only one God. And who is that God? Well, the Lord. But if you look at your Bible, it's all capitals, right? Do you guys see that? The word Lord is all capitals, like those small little capitals. And the reason for that is whenever you see that in your Bible, that is the uh, Hebrew word for Yahweh. So the translation Lord is, is kind of a, um, it's not really a translation of that word, but we don't really know how it would be pronounced or translated. So if you have a King James, it probably says Jehovah. Does anyone have a King James? You didn't bring the, Diana was counting on you. <laughs> Who has a new King James? What, what does it say for Lord? Does it just say Lord? Okay. Uh, but, but that old King James word, Jehovah, that is just the word Yahweh with the vowels from another Hebrew uh, word, Adonai, which means Lord. Long story. Don't worry about it. What you need to know is that when you see this word in the Old Testament, Lord, in all caps, uh, it is the name of God, the divine name, the name that out of the burning bush God says, I am that I am. It's, it's the term Yahweh. So it's, it's much more specific than the general word, word Lord, and that's going to be very important as we, as we go on. So Deuteronomy 4.35 is clear. There is one God, and it is Yahweh, the Lord. There is no other besides him. Um, and we see this all over the place in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. There is only one Yahweh. There is only one God, okay? God is one. It's very clear. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10 says the same thing. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. So how many gods are there? One God, okay? Now, again, this is the oneness of God. We're going to see the plurality of God later. But this is the oneness that we see clearly in Scripture. So this is kind of the foundation for the Trinity. We also see this idea in the New Testament. Um, 1 Corinthians 8, 4. Paul says, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that, quote, an idol has no real existence, and that, quote, there is no God but one. So what Paul is saying is those idols are not, they're not real, there's, there's one God, okay? So even though we see Paul calling Jesus God and things like that, he's still saying there's only one God. Ephesians 4, he says the same thing, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay? So the oneness of God. God is one. Make sense? Monotheism. God is one. But the Bible does not teach what you might call a strict monotheism. So uh, strict monotheists would be Islam. Um, we are not Muslims, if you didn't know. Uh, we, and one of the main differences, there are obviously many, but one of the main differences in our understanding of God is the Trinity. Uh, and so we believe in the plurality of God. Now, that may sound weird, but let me show you. So in the first place we can go to see this is in the Old Testament. There are um, hints of the plurality of God even in the Old Testament. And what's really interesting about this is the Jews, so when we think about Judaism now, oftentimes what we're thinking about is modern Judaism. Um, or at least Judaism that has taken place after all the Christian stuff, Jesus and the New Testament. And what happened within the history of Judaism is you can imagine how traumatic um, the rise of Christianity would be to an a unbelieving Jew, right? Um, and so they reacted against a lot of the things that the Christians were teaching. And so um, and, and one, of, one of these things is their understanding of plurality. So if you read... Jewish writers that came before Jesus, uh, they talk about the plurality of God that's in the Old Testament. 
if you read Jewish writers that come after Jesus, all of a sudden they're like, we don't talk like that, that's heresy. Because they know as soon as you start talking like that, that's how Christians talk about the Old Testament, because that's, that's what it's saying. Does that make sense? So some of the um, Jewish writers before Christ came would read the Old Testament and see this idea of plurality. They would even say things like, um, there are two Yahwehs in the Old Testament. There is an invisible Yahweh and a visible one, um, which that's the pre-incarnate son, and we'll see that. Uh, there are two powers in heaven, and they did that because of passages like Genesis 18. So if you want to look at Genesis 18, uh, we'll kind of be looking at this just for a second here. So again, remember, when you see Lord with all the capitals, that is the divine name. So we see visible and invisible Yahweh. So Genesis 18 says, And the Lord, Yahweh, appeared to him, this is Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Now already you're kind of like, wait a minute, the Lord appeared. The Lord is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. No one can see him and live. That's true. And yet we have passages like this. So you can see where the Jews are reading it going, there's like a visible and an invisible Yahweh. Yes, so it says he lifted, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed down, bowed himself to the earth. And then if you skip over to verse 13 in Genesis 18, we see that one of these supposed men is Yahweh himself. The Lord, Yahweh, said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Shall I indeed bear a child? For now that I'm old, is anything too hard for Yahweh? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this next time, next year, and Sarah shall have a son. So you have this really weird thing where Abraham sees three men. One of them he talks to is identified in the text as Yahweh himself. And then this Yahweh also speaks about himself in the third person, uh, which is kind of, it's kind of strange. You see that? And so you have to hold this tension in the Old Testament of, God is invisible, he's a spirit, he doesn't have a body like men, uh, you can't see him and live, and yet you have people in the Old Testament who talk to Yahweh himself. This is not an angel. This is the Lord himself. So again, these are hints, right? That looking back on the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, we can see, because we know, well, who is the visible manifestation of God? Come on. Thank you. Jesus. Guys, Sunday school answer. Let's all say it together. Jesus. Yeah, just say Jesus and you'll get it right most of the time. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's what we know, right? Uh, he has revealed God to us, John 1.18. Genesis 19, we see another hit, hint at this. Look at, if you just flip over to Genesis 19.24. This is another really weird verse. And you can see how this idea of um, two Yahwehs would develop. Genesis 19.24. Then the Lord Yahweh rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord, Yahweh, out of heaven. Isn't that a strange verse? So Yahweh is raining fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven. It's kind of a strange verse, right? Again, these are hints of the plurality within God. We see another one in Joshua 5. This is one of my favorites. Joshua 5, 13. So the Israelites have come into the promised land. They're about to... Um, They've crossed over, and they're about to, to come into contact with the first city, which they are to uh, take over, which is Jericho. That's a famous story. Joshua is standing on a hill above the city, kind of just, he's a military commander. He's taking stock of what they've got to do. There's the city with these huge walls, and he's realizing this doesn't look doable. And he meets a character, and this is what the text says in Joshua 5.13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes. That same language, Genesis 18. When people lift up their eyes, they often see Yahweh. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man, this is also like Genesis 18, was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. It's pretty striking. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he, this character, said, No the best answer. Are, are you for us or for our adversaries? No. And this is what he says, but I am the commander of the army of Yahweh. Now I have come. Okay, so that's all he says. Joshua, I mean, you, you can imagine he must have been a pretty intimidating figure. Joshua is a warrior, and yet he's intimidated by this guy. 
That's all he says. No, I'm not for you or for your adversaries. That's a bad question, in other words. But I am the commander of the army of Yahweh, so the leader of the armies of heaven, and I have come. The sword is drawn. Like, it's about to go down. Joshua's reaction is exactly what you'd expect. He fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Now, what happens in the Bible when people try to worship angels? Yeah, they're like, don't be afraid. No, no, get up, get up. You should, yeah, don't worship me. Um, this guy doesn't do that. Joshua falls down, worships, says to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of Yahweh's army said, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. Okay? Where have we seen language like that in the Old Testament? The burning bush, right? You are in the presence of Yahweh. And Joshua did so very quickly, I'm sure. Um, so again, we see this visible manifestation of Yahweh that is, is Yahweh, but isn't, but is. Um, and so there's this tension developing. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, the angel of the Lord identified as Yahweh. We, I did a whole sermon on this, and you can listen to that. But um, you see the same tension with the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So Exodus 3, this is the burning bush incident. Here's what it says. Uh, and and ba the basic idea, what we're going to see is that the angel of Yahweh is also identified himself as Yahweh. Um, again, he's the visible manifestation of God in the Old Testament. So Moses, Exodus 3.1, was keeping the flock uh, he's, of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He leads his flock out to Horeb, the mountain of God. And this is what the text says, the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now that's weird, because when you think about that story, do you ever think, oh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, or you just, well, no, God appeared to Moses, right? Well, which is it? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, so the angel of the Lord appears to him, so so when Moses looks into the bush, he sees the angel of the Lord, uh, and the bush is burning, it's not yet consumed, but when the angel speaks, it just says, then the Lord saw, and God called, out of, God called to him out of the bush. So again, we see this identification of this visible Yahweh figure with Yahweh himself, and this, when God speaks the angel of the Lord speaks. When the angel of the Lord speaks, God speaks, and he says to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hides his face. The text says, for he was afraid to look at God. Right? So that's what he's seeing. And then, then the Lord said, Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. And who leads the Israelites out of Egypt uh, in the pillar of fire? the angel of the Lord. Uh, so keep, just keep that in the back of your mind for what we'll see in a minute. Okay, so that is the plurality of God in the Old Testament. Any questions on that? Um, there's also some, some stuff about the Spirit. We don't really have time to go into that. Like I said, we're skipping a stone. Um, does that phrase make you a little uncomfortable, the plurality of God? Okay, good. Well, you're Orthodox then. Testing you, testing you. Um, so we also see the plurality. Now, now, really the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed to us in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, like in actual history, right? When God becomes flesh and the Spirit of God descends on him and then the Spirit is poured out, all that stuff happened before it was written down. Um, and so the first Christians who were Jews, they didn't like come to understand the Trinity by reading, um, you know, a systematic theology. They experienced the Trinity in their actual lives, which we, you have as well if your faith is in Christ. Um, but in the text, we see, okay, so there's explicit texts of the deity of Christ. So you can see what we're doing. God is one, and yet the Bible says the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So we have to deal with these, right? There are explicit texts that, that um, say that Jesus is, is God. John 1, 1 through 3. Everyone knows this one. In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's not, and the word was a God. Again, that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses translate it. It's not a good translation. The word was God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. By the way, when you hear that, you can think of all the Old Testament passages where it says that the word of the Lord came to someone. Who's the word of the Lord? Thank, okay, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, See, just say Jesus. You'll, you'll be right most of the time. Uh, 
Right, the Son, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, absolutely. John 1.18 kind of finishes this whole section, and it says this, no one has ever seen God, right? Which is really weird when you count for those passages we just looked at in the Old Testament. I'm pretty sure they saw God, right? Well, kind of, yeah. No one has ever seen God, and then John says, the only begotten God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known, speaking of Christ. Pretty clear. Jesus is God. Romans 9.5 is another clear, just explicit one. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So, pretty clear, Jesus is just explicitly called God in the New Testament. Probably nothing new to you, I would hope. But there's this whole other category um, of texts that are less explicit, and I think just absolutely fascinating. And if you are talking with the Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll argue with you till you're blue in the face and probably know more than you about these other ones that we just talked about because they just spend time rehearsing these uh, dialogues about them. But those aren't the only texts we have to talk about Jesus being God. We have a whole list of texts, and we're not going to do all of them, that refer, what they do is they take passages from the Old Testament that are explicitly about Yahweh, the Lord, and use them to talk about Jesus. Does that make sense? So you have these passages in the Old Testament, and I'll show you one that say, this is about God, and then, you know, Paul or one of the other authors will just say, yeah, it's about Jesus. Um, so some of them you might not even realize. Romans 10 is a uh, famous passage. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, okay, so that should ring some bells, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, now, again, that can just, if you only had that text, okay, well, God raised Jesus from the dead, so maybe Jesus isn't God. Um, Paul continues, says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And then Paul says this, he says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For, quote, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so who is Paul identifying as the Lord in that passage? Okay. Yeah, come on, Jesus, right, yes. Okay, so he's quoting Joel 2, 32. And if you look in your Old Testament, you'll see that Lord in Joel 2, 32 is Yahweh. Okay, so here's what Joel 2, 32 says. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh, the Lord, shall be saved. Uh, and then, then it goes on. Um, those who are saved are those whom Yahweh, the Lord, calls. So what Paul is saying is, you can see, he's identifying Jesus as Yahweh. So he's saying when Joel said that, and he says everyone who calls on the divine name, Yahweh, who is God in the Old Testament, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is Lord. The confession of a Christian is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Yahweh. Pretty, there's a lot of texts like this that are really cool. Um, 1 Peter 3, 14 through 15. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So that's like a famous one for evangelism apologetics, right? Uh, Peter is citing Isaiah, and again, we see the exact same thing. Isaiah 8, 12. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. So you can see why Peter is using this. He's talking about persecution. And this is what Isaiah says. But Yah the Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. So Peter takes that passage and says, honor Christ as holy in your hearts. You see what he's, he's just equating Christ and Yahweh. Um, and this is how the apostles read the Bible. When the Old Testament, they saw Yahweh, they're like, yeah, that's about Jesus. That, does that make sense? These are much less explicit if you're just reading and don't know the Old Testament really well. Uh, but these are in one sense, even more thorough proof uh, of the deity, the full deity of Christ. And this is the, the foundation for the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, one of the, another really cool one here is John 12. So John is in a, a dialogue, or Jesus is in a dialogue. Uh, it says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. 
Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's Isaiah 53. Okay. Uh, Therefore they could not believe, John says. And then he quotes Isaiah again, and it says, it says, For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. Now that's from Isaiah 6. You guys remember what happens in Isaiah 6? It's when, I, it's when Isaiah is, is taken into the throne room of God, and he sees uh, God on his throne. He sees Yahweh on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the entire temple. Okay, and it, woe is me, and I'm a man of unclean lips. Um, that's that scene. Then John says this, after quoting Isaiah 6, he says this, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. What he, John is saying here is when Isaiah was taken to the throne room of God and saw Yahweh on his throne, he saw the, pre, the, the son. He saw Jesus. That's what he's equating here. And it's not as clear in the, um, what we have in our Old Testament. So if you uh, look at ours, it says that his, uh, it says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne and his robe filled the temple. But if you look at the, the Greek Old Testament, which is what they, he's quoting here, the language is almost identical. Uh, this is what the Greek Old Testament says. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and raised up, and the house was full of his glory. And so what John is saying here in John 12 is, when Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, he saw Christ. He saw the Son and spoke of him. That's why he said these things. He saw, um, the Septuagint says, the Lord of hosts, uh, which is just absolutely Wild. Isaiah 6, 5, this is where Isaiah says, A wretched man that I am, I am stunned for being a man and having unclean lips. I live among a people having unclean lips, and I have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, with my eyes. So John is saying, yeah, Isaiah saw the pre-incarnate Son. This is why uh, Jesus can say in John 8, before uh, he says to the, the Pharisees, yeah, I know you guys think you're sons of Abraham. I, I've actually talked to Abraham. And he saw my day, and he was glad. And like, what are you talking about? You're not even yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Well, we just saw in Genesis 18 a time when Yahweh talked to Abraham, right? It's, it's, it kind of connects all the dots for us. Um, and that's when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And they try to kill him because they realize that he's equating himself with uh, Yahweh. Uh, there's a ton more of these. Philippians 2, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. What is the confession in Philippians? That Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. That's another quotation from Isaiah. And in Isaiah, who's the one saying to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance? God, Yahweh. And now Paul is saying, yeah, the fulfillment of that verse is not the confession that Yahweh is God, but that Jesus Christ is Yahweh. Uh, so you can see, again, this is how they're reading it. And this is one of the, I think this last one is the most fun, one of the most fun. Jude 1.5. Turn to Jude 1.5. Uh, really, well, it's just Jude 5, I guess. Only one chapter. It's right before Revelation. Uh, th- this, one is, this one is so fun. Jude says this. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And again, if you're not reading the Old Testament like the apostles, Jesus saved, what? No, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. What do you mean he saved the people out of Egypt? Well, if you've been tracking with where we're going, Jesus uh, is eternal, and he is the visible manifestation of Yahweh. Do you, do you see that in the text? So, um, now, obviously, the man, Jesus, was, was born through the Virgin Mary, but the eternal Son of God, which is who Jesus was, has existed eternally. And he was operating and active in the Old Testament, and he was saving his people out of the land of Egypt and destroying those who did not believe. Now, this is really important, and this is where some of this kind of um, hits the ground for us. This affects the way that we think about God. Right? So if you kind of take like the, 
just kind of standard stuff. Sometimes, you know, you'll hear people say things like, oh, well, yeah, in the Old Testament, God is, you know, really angry and harsh, and he does these things. But in the New Testament, it's really all about love, and, like, Jesus is kind of, you know, he's much nicer than the Old Testament God. I mean, these things are blasphemous, but we're all tempted to think like this sometimes. If you understand what I've been drawing out for you, if you understand the doctrine of the Trinity, and you even just understand Jude 5, that destroys that whole paradigm, right? Jude's like, oh, yeah, um, who threw Pharaoh and his army into the sea and drowned them? That was Jesus, right? Um, who was the one who killed the entire generation of Israelites in the wilderness? That was Jesus. Like, this affects the way that we do these things. So when Moses, after they come through the Red Sea, Moses sings this song, and he, and he says, I will sing to Yahweh, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea Yahweh is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord, or he says, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. So this protects us. Understanding these things protects us from falling into some of these traps of reading the Bible in some weird way where God is changing, and he was mean then, and now he's nice. Completely, completely wrong. Jesus is Yahweh. So we cannot read the Bible like that. And if you just read till Revelation 19, you'll see that this idea of Yahweh as a warrior, as a man of war, is fulfilled in Christ as well. And that what that does, understanding that, it just heightens the gospel even more. Because this God, the the Yahweh, who is a man of war, a warrior, is the one who came and suffered and died for us. You see how that that helps us? And not only that, but this is what Paul always does when he's speaking to the persecuted church. He reminds them of the image of Christ as the divine warrior who will will, um, avenge them and who will protect them. That's Revelation 19. He will set all things right by destroying all of his enemies. So this is how understanding this uh, helps us read the Bible as well. So that's the deity of Christ. The deity of the Holy Spirit is also clearly taught in the New Testament. Uh, We'll hit this pretty quick. Um, John 16, Jesus says, but if I go, I will send him to you, the Holy Spirit. So he's a person. He's not a a force or something like that. Uh, He he does things. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He calls him the spirit of truth. He will guide you into the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. You're seeing the unity of God here as well. Jesus also says the same thing. I only say what I hear from the Father. The Spirit only says what he hears from the Father. So you can see the unity of God at work there. These aren't three different uh, like beings that are doing different things. This is one God working in three persons. Uh, Peter in Acts 5, this is another one we get where we see the Holy Spirit identified as God. The whole Ananias and Sapphira thing where they lie about how much money they made and how much they're giving. Peter says this, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So he's a person. You can lie to him. To lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds. And then later, uh, Peter says, you have not lied to man, but to God. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he says, you have not lied to man, but to God. Um, and then he later says, you've tested the spirit of the Lord. So we, we can see that. Um, there are tons of references to the spirit in Acts. The spirit does all the things that a person would do. He speaks, he forbids, um, he, he, he thinks things, he appoints, he sends, he bears witness, he snatches Philip, um, he prevents things. Um, we know that the, the scripture was inspired by the spirit, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. So men writing scripture and the prophets spoke from God, carried along by the Holy Spirit. So again, spoke from God, carried along by the Holy Spirit, same thing. The Spirit is God, the Spirit of Yahweh. He's called the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. And so the Spirit is also Yahweh. This is the foundation of the doctrine of the Trinity. The Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, the Spirit is Yahweh, and yet there is only one Yahweh. So we also then get Trinitarian formulas in the New Testament. So times where all three of them are brought together. Um, the, the, one of the clearest in the Gospels is the baptism of Jesus. So Jesus uh, had been baptized. He's praying. And then it says, Luke 3 says, the heavens were opened 
The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So we see Father, Son, and Spirit all in the same passage there. Um, Paul brings them together in 2 Corinthians 13. He says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Trinitarian formula, you can see it. Christ, God, Spirit. Peter does this in 1 Peter. Uh, to those who are elect exiles, he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ for the sprinkling of his blood. Father, Son, and Spirit, right there. And then the clearest, most explicit statement of Trinitarian theology, Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular. So singular name. There is one name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's the divine name? Yahweh. And so we're baptizing them into the name. Now, again, it's very, the language is very precise. It's not the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. It is baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Singular name and yet three persons. It's Trinitarian theology explicitly. So to sum that all up, one God, Yahweh, the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, the Holy Spirit is Yahweh, but there are not three Yahwehs. There is one, one Lord, one God. The Father is not part of God. He is God. The Son is not part of God. He is God. The Holy Spirit is not part of God. He is God. That is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity, the triunity. Uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but there aren't three gods. There's one God. So that's the oneness and the threeness. Any questions on that? That is a lot. Um, but can you see kind of where that's coming from? So this isn't just some doctrine pulled out of thin air. This is just coming out of the pages of Scripture. Now, what happens in church history is we need language to talk about these things. And so that's where the creeds come in. That's where uh, theologians throughout the centuries come in and help uh, try to condense these ideas into language so that we can talk about them. So every time we talk about it, we don't have to cite all these verses like and get nowhere, essentially. Um, and so we have really helpful language. You can see this in all the creeds. So the Nicene Creed, you can see this idea of oneness and threeness. Um, the beginning says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. So if you just read that, you'd be like, oh, so the Father is God, but not Jesus or the Spirit. And Jehovah's Witnesses would be like, see, we told you. Um, but if you go to the next verse, or the next paragraph, it says, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. You see that? So they're saying there's only one God. The Father is God. Jesus is God. And then when you get down to the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, depending on if you're in the West and the East, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. So there's only one God, guys. The Father is God. Jesus is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But there are not three gods. And so the Athanasian Creed sums it up beautifully when it says that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. Meaning, we, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, so we don't confuse the persons, we keep them distinct, and yet we also don't divide God into parts. One God, three persons, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the nature, the being of God. Does that make sense? It's pretty, pretty standard orthodoxy stuff. Um, so the three persons term we use, the three persons, are distinct. We distinguish them, but they are indivisible. So they're not divided. They're distinct and yet not divided. That's very impossible. Um, so we don't confuse them. Our own confession, the Baptist Faith of Message 2000, uh, has a wonderful statement on this. It says, the eternal triune God reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with distinct personal attributes, but without division of nature essence, or being. So it's pretty much saying the same thing. Three persons who are distinct, and yet they're not divided. One nature, one being of God. God is one. God is three. 
That's how we talk about it. So unity, uh, when we talk about the unity of God, the oneness of God, we use the language of being or nature or substance. Um, and, and some of this is just that we have to give it a name, something a name. So what is the oneness of God? It's his being, it's his nature, his substance. Now when we distinguish, we dis- distinguish the three persons, we talk about persons, um, which is not a great, why might that be a dangerous word to use uh, with our modern language and ideas? Yeah, we think people. When you think persons, what do you think of? Like individuals, right? Um, which I hope you can see already that when we talk about the Trinity, we're not talking about three individuals, right? There's one individual, actually, we would say, that's God. Um, so persons, it's the historic language, and it meant something different back then than it means now, so it's, it's okay to keep it, but I want you to be careful uh, as you think of God, as you worship. Um, we can go down some, some weird and, and heretical roads with this word person if we give that word uh, personality, three personalities, that's not it. Three individuals, no. Three wills, no. Uh, three, like, centers of consciousness, no. Um, th- there's only one will of God. There- there's only one God, not three. Uh, the Trinity is not a community of three people or three beings. That's, that's heresy. Uh, there's not three wills. It's one God, three persons. So just be careful as you're thinking about um, God that you're not dividing him into three gods. Um, and that you're not just flattening them out into just one God, one person. That would also be a mistake. And so one of the church fathers, Gregory of Nazianzus, has a great quote on this uh, about kind of going back and forth in his mind between the threeness of God and the oneness of God. He says, No sooner do I conceive of the one than I am enlightened by the radiance of the three. No sooner do I distinguish them than I am carried back to the one. When I think of any one of the three, I think of him as the whole, and my vision is filled, and the greater part of what I conceive escapes me. I cannot grasp the greatness to the others. When I contemplate the three together, I see but one luminary, and cannot divide or measure out the undivided light. Brilliant. So he's going between three and one, three and one, and essentially says it's, praise God. Um, so three persons, but not three personalities, and that's, that's really important. So it's pretty late. I'm just going to what we, this, this is, yeah, we'll finish, don't worry. What do, this, is, this is a huge, the reason I'm saying this is a huge question. We could spend weeks on this. What distinguishes, you, yes, yes. You know what, if I had candy, I'd throw you candy. Uh, you should bring candy. Um, what distinguishes the persons of the Trinity? Now that is a massive question. Okay, so if there's one God and one being, and there's this threeness of persons, what distinguishes them? What's different about, what's distinct about them? We wouldn't want to say different, right? Trinitarian, when you get into the weeds on Trinitarian theology, there's just like heresy on every corner. Um, what is distinct about them? And, and this is what the, the church has said, and this will sound confusing, and then I'll explain it, and it's not that confusing. So um, basically what the church has said is, don't say any more than this. This is what we would say. What's distinct about the Father is he is unbegotten, or what the, another word the church has used is um, paternity. What is distinct about the Son is that he's eternally begotten. Fancy word is filiation. Uh, the, what's distinct about the Holy Spirit? Well, that he's proceeding or aspirated. So essentially what that means is, well, what's distinct about the Father? Well, he's the Father. What's distinct about the Son? Well, his sonship. What's distinct about the, the Spirit? Well, his... He's the Spirit. So that's, that's, what's this, that's, that's what the Bible says. And so where we get into trouble is when we try to go beyond that. Um, and, and we've all, and we, most of us have probably done this, and we've probably heard people do this, where you get into all sorts of strange things about, well, the Father, you know, tells the Son what to do, and the Son and eternity is submissive. And we're just in a whole world of, like, horrible ideas about the Trinity, where in the one being of God, you've got different wills and different beings, and That is not the revelation of the Trinity uh, from Scripture. So when you think of the persons and what distinguishes them, it's enough to say the Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, and the Spirit is the Spirit. Praise God. Um, And we see them, the the Bible, um, appropriating language to them in these roles in what they do in history 
but we have to be careful as we think about kind of what they've done in history back into the eternality of God. Like I said, there's a lot that we could talk about there. Um, Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yes. So that would be what we would call uh, the economy of salvation, so as we see it played out. But we would not say uh, that God in eternity past um, is there's only one God. So we can't say that they're all doing different things. Um, and yet, when we talk about salvation, we can see as God is revealed. Like I said, it's a long conversation that we don't have time to get into. Um, a fascinating and I think really edifying one. Um, but I, tonight, I wanted to kind of get the, the basis uh, established. So the other thing I wanted to just talk about really quick is there are some so classic Trinitarian heresies, um, ones that have come up through history. So Arianism denies the eternality and the equality of the Son. So Arius was a bishop in the 4th century. He, just, he taught the Son was an exalted but a created being. Okay, that's obviously not true in Scripture. Um, condemned at the Council of Nicaea. Modern-day Arians, Jehovah's Witnesses. Right? So if you've heard kind of their stuff, they're Arians. Jesus is a great being. He's the agent of creation, but God created him at a point. He's not God in and of himself. That's heresy. And it's, you know, if you talk to them, guys, we dealt with this like 1,700 years ago. Uh, get with the picture. Um, modalism is another one that's still around today. And this is, uh, denies the distinction of the three persons. So modalism teaches that there is one God who exists as one person. And he just shows up as different persons sometimes. So there's one God. Sometimes he shows up as the Father. Sometimes he shows up as the Son. Sometimes he shows up as the Spirit. But it's, it's just one God, um, not three persons. Now, there's a way in which we're tempted to think this way sometimes, um, but that is, is heresy. The threeness of God is not um, surface level. It's real, and yet the unity of God is real as well. Um, so modalism, bad. Don't do it. Um, tritheism, pretty clear. That's just denying the oneness of God and, and thinking of God or teaching of God as three distinct persons, distinct beings with three wills and, you know, things like that. Um, again, we can be tempted to think that way sometimes. Um, we use language sometimes that is kind of in that vein, which we have to be very careful of. Um, there's another heresy in church history called Patropassianism, which, again, denies the distinction of the person. So speaking as if the father died on the cross. No, it wasn't the father. It was the son. Um, and yet we can say it was God, but it wasn't the father. Again, we distinguish. We distinguish between these things. Well, why? Because the Bible does. That's why we speak this way. So we have to be careful of things like that. Partialism, that each person are part, is a part of God. So in and of himself, Jesus isn't all of God. He's just a part of God. And the, again, the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity says, no, each person is fully and truly God. There is only one God. Jesus is God. The Spirit is God. The Father is God. And yet we distinguish between the persons. We're all tempted and can fall into talking in some of these ways or thinking these ways. So just be careful as you do that. We want to think about God rightly because we want to get the gospel rightly and because we want to worship rightly and because we know that his revelation of himself is perfect and good and true and right. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's the test, and then we'll be done. So I'm testing you guys. No, but it's a good guess. Okay, so we're going to go through some classic analogies of the Trinity, and you tell me what's wrong with them. Should, you should be pretty easy. Okay, so the Trinity is like, and we've all probably used these, and so just, you know, we'll, we'll have an um, amnesty. If you've used this, don't feel bad. Um, the Trinity is like a three-leaf clover. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and yet there's one clover. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so that's partialism, right? Because each piece of the clover is not fully the clover, right? So that's, don't, please don't use that. It's accidentally teaching heresy. It's not a good analogy for the Trinity. But let me tell you this one. The Trinity is like 
water, it can be a liquid, it can be ice, it can be steam, and yet it's all water. You guys have all seen the video. Come on, it's not fun. Uh, if you don't know what they're talking about, it's a wonderful video. That's modalism. So there is one, I know, well, there's no TV. Uh, yeah, it actually, it, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, that's modalism. That's, that's heretical thinking that there's this one thing. Sometimes it just shows up as each one. It can't be two at the same time um, unless you get into some weird quantum physics that we're not going to do. Uh, the Trinity is like an egg. It's got the yolk and the white and the shell. Yeah, this partialism too. Um, okay, here, here's, a, here's one. The Trinity is like Spider-Man and the multiverse. And there's three Peter Parkers, right? Have you? That was fast. Yeah, that's tritheism. Um, good. I don't even have to explain it more. And I've never seen that movie, so thank you. Um, so there's no analogy that really works. And obviously, when you were trying to use analogies, we're trying to help. But when it comes to the nature of God, it's not helpful. Um, just stick with the biblical and creedal language. One God, eternally existing in three persons. Um, and really, and what Fred Sanders, he's a uh, well-known Trinitarian theologian, he, he has this, he has a great book on this called The Deep Things of God, but um, he says, look, don't try to do all these analogies, just talk about salvation history and you'll talk about the Trinity. Uh, basically, kind of what you were saying, Rod. Um, we don't need to go somewhere strange with this. So I had more, uh, we will, let me end with this. Um, there's a misconception at times that the Trinity is impossible to understand, it's confusing, it's irrational, but we just have to accept it. Uh, no, that's not true, and I hope we wouldn't believe that because the Trinity is foundational to understanding the gospel. Um, one God revealed to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and Fred Sanders, kind of in, in reaction to that idea that, oh, we just can't really know, it's just, we, you know, it's not logical. This is what he says, it, and, and I love this, we'll end with this. He says, probably the most common misconception is the fear that it really doesn't make sense. That somehow we became Christians and that committed us to believe in certain things. And unfortunately, one of those things is rationally impossible. But the Trinity is not irrational in any direct sense. I think the main intellectual problem with the Trinity is that it's so dense. When we say the Trinity, we are really saying all the basic elements of the gospel at once. So it's a very dense formula, sort of like E equals MC squared is difficult to understand, not because it's logically contradictory, but because there's so much information packed into it. The Trinity would be irrational if it were self-contradictory. For example, if it said that there are three persons in God and yet God is only one person, or if it said that God is one being and God is three beings. But for God to be one being who is three persons in no way contradicts the laws of logic. Now, I love this part right here. Now, it may be beyond our understanding in some way because we don't know of any other being like that. It's a mystery, but a mystery is not an excuse to stop thinking. A mystery is something that is bigger than our minds can take in and invites us to a lifetime of intellectual wrestling. Amen. Hallelujah. I praise God that we have an incomprehensible God because that shows us that he is not something that was created by men. Amen? Uh, let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you.